All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Trent Taylor with McGuire Woods, and uh, we're gonna be talking today about dark patterns, litigation, and enforcement. And we're so pleased that you were able to join us. Um, before we get into it, uh, I wanted to just mention that this is the first, the inaugural um, event um, in a new sort of series that we have started, which is the Consumer Product and Retail Brown Bag Lunch Series, where I think a lot of you are probably familiar with our quarterly webinar that we do, uh, where we cover a lot. And we wanted to do this um, for a couple of different reasons. One is it will allow us to maybe go a little more in depth um, on a particular topic than we're able to do so in the quarterly webinar. Uh, number two, hopefully it will be a little more interactive, a little bit more of a conversation, um, that kind of thing. And then number three, I think we're going to try to do this as we're able on a roughly monthly basis. And, and it's going to cover some topics that may be a little further afield um, than what we might cover in our quarterly webinar, but that are still important. For instance, we may have one on insurance recovery or you know deals in this space um, in private equity um, it, it could be all sorts of things um, so i guess what i would say is thank you for joining us and you know watch for the next one of these that comes in and um, we uh, would love to have you attend some of these in the future as well all right so hosting today's program uh, is myself and Frank Talbot, um, also with McGuire Woods, and we frequently work together and we have done a lot of dark pattern stuff, um, both in terms of class actions, as well as regulatory enforcement, and also just counseling clients about some of the regulatory aspects of this. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Frank. Actually, I wanna show you what we're gonna do today. Then I'll turn, turn it over to Frank. This is sort of our roadmap of what we're planning to do today. We're going to start with what are dark patterns, give examples. And we're going to spend quite a lot of time on the examples because, you know, frequently the term dark patterns is used, uh, but it's not always explained exactly what it means. And so we're going to hopefully walk through um, some of the most common types of dark patterns, show you what it means and what, you know, potentially the problems are and then we're going to talk about dark pattern enforcement, and um, which will include class actions, uh, regulatory landscape, and then perhaps the most important part of this, which is how to mitigate risk and um, you know reduce the chances that um, businesses are going to be targeted here. So um, with that, let me turn it over to Frank, uh, who is going to introduce us to this topic. One other thing I'll say real quick. Um, we would love to have questions, so don't be shy in terms of um, entering questions into the Q&A um, at any point, and we'll try to get to them and answer them as quickly as we're able. So, um, I'm gonna... Thanks, Trent. Um, so, dark patterns, uh, it's, a it's a phrase that was largely uh, coined by a guy named Harry Brignall, um, and he generally did it. Um, he had he had twelve dark patterns that he identified and gave them names. Um, but and they generally related to website design and user experience um, for a consumer. Um, but they can really be grouped into uh, some larger buckets. And so um, dark patterns can be design practices that. Um, either try and trick or manipulate users into making um, choices they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, it tries to steer consumers, according to him, to be more expensive, uh, the longer term um, auto enrollment, uh, continuous payment uh, that allegedly is um, deceptive to the consumer but beneficial to the seller. Um, and really, uh, his focus was on, as I mentioned, online uh, online sales. Um, but it's not really limited to just um, to just the online experience. That's just the most prevalent uh, 
place where they're found. Um, <clears throat> so one of the, uh, here are a couple of examples of the high level, making a customer navigate multiple screens to cancel a subscription and just making it really difficult uh, for the consumer uh, to cancel. And he actually termed this one the Roach Motel. Um, uh, all you could probably call it the Hotel California where you can check in, but you can never leave. Um, but the whole idea with that is to lock the consumer in without uh, the end their payments without being able to uh, get get out. Um, another example would be making expensive options uh, more brightly colored or, or kind of making them stand out. And uh, online, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but again, this concept isn't necessarily um, limited to the online context. Uh, you could be in a store and have the advertisements and arrows and bright lights flashing, pointing to uh, trying to get the consumer in to, to buy the, the more uh, expensive option. Uh, the falsely telling consumers there are only a few left or that the sale ends in like 10 minutes. Um, I, I think that we've all probably experience that in one place or another online when you're buying tickets, uh, whether it be on an airline or to a live event, uh, or if you are looking to buy something, uh, the toy for Christmas your kid wants, and the website's saying there are only a, there are only a few left. Hurry up and buy. Uh, it's the point there is trying to create a, a false sense of of urgency. Um, and then the not telling consumers the full price until the last page of checkout. Uh, a lot of that, that relates to uh, hidden fees or undisclosed fees that um, you get to the very end of checkout online and your price was uh, on the web page was $20 and you were told that you could only get it for five more minutes and there was only one left and then you get to the end of checkout and there's uh, service fees, um, service charges, and uh, additional things other than just taxes. Um, and again, the dark pattern piece there is that you've kind of got the consumer all the way to the end. Does the consumer really want to go back and, and not buy this that might not be available at that price in five minutes or not, might not be available um, because my kid's going to be super disappointed that uh, the toy they wanted uh, wasn't any longer available. Um, so with that, uh, you know, one of the things that Trent and I wanted to do was just sort of highlight ourselves uh, some things that may or may not be considered dark pattern um, and that we'll highlight during the, uh, during the presentation with some of these examples. And I know that uh, for me, one of the things that uh, I that frustrates me sometimes is when I'm booking a family summer vacation. I'm booking it eight, nine months, ten months in advance to get a, a beach house in Virginia. We're in Virginia, and so if and I get to the checkout of uh, whatever site I'm using, and there's a, a an option that is already checked trip insurance for, you know, a quarter of the price that's going to make it way more expensive. Uh, you know, we're in Virginia, the, the likelihood of a hurricane coming and uh, ruining the week is pretty low. And so I, I always, I generally always unclick it just because I don't want to pay um, an additional amount of money uh, for 10 months out when there's no reason for me to believe I can't do it. Um, and Sometimes it'll, sometimes the website will say, are you sure? Are you sure you want to forego the full cost of your trip if you have to cancel it? And yes, I do, because I don't want to pay uh, several hundred dollars more just to, for some contingency that's unlikely to happen. Um, another one uh, that I often consider uh, is when flying uh, there, you're going through checkout, I buy my tickets. And then before I check out, it's like, are you sure you want to, you don't want to upgrade? Uh, it's more comfortable, more uh, more leg room, uh, more space. It's uh, you'll have a lot more fun flying uh, in first class than you will back in coach, um, which all may be true. Um, 
and depending on the length of the flight may actually be preferable. Um, but I, I generally, it, it's trying to get me to pay for something that I didn't originally buy that I didn't want or need. Um, so Trent, did you have any that you, uh, that you yourself have experienced? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, and, and thanks for that, Frank. So, um, I too, you know, deal with the trip insurance a lot. We, we try to travel a lot. Um, but I never go first class. I have a family of five and we try to get the cheapest airline tickets we can. And one of the things that we sometimes experience is if you go to the various websites and you type in five tickets, almost always it's going to give you a really expensive price, uh, because it's giving you the, the most expensive option where there's, you know, five together. Um, and I've found that what you have to do and what I have to do uh, often is go in and type in two and see if I can get a cheaper price for those tickets. And always, every single time there, there, there are. So I have to piecemeal it, I have to get one transaction with two tickets and a different transaction with three. I'm not sure that's necessarily a dark pattern, but it is frustrating. Um, and then the other thing that I've experienced, which you know, I'm not sure it's a dark pattern, but it's adjacent to dark pattern. It's just the number of clicks that you have to do to get through certain websites. And I particularly see it uh, usually when I'm trying to check in for a flight and I have to click like 15 times just to actually check in, even though I don't want any of the upgrades. I don't want any of the, the, the other, you know, deals they're trying to give to me. Um, and it can be frustrating. So, um, and I'm sure there's lots of other ones that folks experience a lot uh, of the time. And the simple fact of the matter is this, we are surrounded by what we term dark patterns. They, um, they are ubiquitous um, and we deal with them all day, every day. And, and I think it's important to, you know, sort of remember um, that it's not just digital, right? So it, the, the next slide that I, I, I wanted to sort of maybe talk about a little bit is that dark patterns are not new. Um, I, I think sometimes when you, you have all of this breathless coverage out there about dark patterns in, in the news, um, you know, the, the, it makes it seem like this is this new idea out there and it's really not new. Uh, vendors have almost always used every tactic they can think of to market their products better. That's not a surprise. Um, and I got a couple of examples up here. One is, and, and you, you would have to be uh, as old as I am to remember this one, but the old Columbia Record Company, they would offer, you know, like 12 cassettes or 12 records for a penny. And then they eventually changed it to like six CDs for $1. And the idea behind it was if you did this sort of free trial, then you were more or less auto enrolled in their club. And, um, and, and then they would charge you like, I don't know whether it was a monthly or yearly fee. Um, and it, then it was very difficult to cancel. And I remember distinctly my mother, I was a big music guy growing up, my mother trying to dissuade me from doing that. And I was saying, but it's such a great deal. We can just cancel later. And she's, you know, very wisely sort of said, it will not be as easy to cancel as you think. Um, another example is, you know, uh, we've all bought cars and there's always sort of, you know, quasi hidden fees that are included, such as the destination charge or all these other charges that are not really explained what they are and they, are just sort of tacked on um, at the end of the process. So this dark patterns are not new. And we have a, uh, a quote here from the FTC, if the FTC and the negative option rule, um, you know, acknowledge that this has been a persistent source of consumer harm for decades. So even before this whole digital idea, uh, dark patterns uh, existed and they were a problem. It's just, now it's a lot more prevalent because it's digital and it's a lot easier in some ways to enforce because the FTC doesn't need to go to this particular dealership, um, you know, car dealership to enforce it. They can just get on the website and see what the problem is. Um, so that's one thing I guess I wanted to know. Another one, oh, and, and the other example I wanted to give, and, and I was in New York last week, 
I was actually speaking about dark patterns at a conference and um, I, I was flying out of the new revamped LaGuardia airport. And one of the things I noticed that they did um, is as you go into your terminal, you are required to go through, I don't even think it's duty free, I think it's just shopping. They funnel all of the you know uh, passengers through this shopping area. And I know, I know they do it a lot in Europe as well with the hopes that you know, you'll decide, oh my gosh, there's some chocolate or there's you know, something else, I'm gonna go buy that as you're walking to your gate. That is a form of dark patterns. Um, it is not illegal uh, that I know of, um, but you know, it's just another example of the kind of thing that, that is being done on a non-digital level. Now, the other thing that I think is a really important point here is that dark patterns are not all bad or even intentional. Um, FTC recognizes this in their negative option rule. They said these programs are widespread in the marketplace and can, and can provide substantial benefits for sellers and consumers. Um, and, and you know, a really good example is auto enrollment. Um, it's obviously bad if you're auto enrolled in a particular thing where you know you're showing up on your credit card, um, you know, every month or every year and you're unaware that that happened. But if you are aware, it can actually uh, be a time saver. You know, you don't have to go in and think about that every day, or excuse me, um, you know, every month, every year, whatever it is. Uh, for instance, you know, I, I subscribe to Sirius XM and I love it and I'm gonna continue to do it. And uh, I am auto enrolled and, you know, and, and they will send an email every year saying it's about to renew. If you wanna cancel, here's what you need to do. Uh, but other than that, I don't have to do anything. And so that's nice. So, you know, I do think it's really important to keep in mind that dark patterns are not all bad. Um, and, you know, sometimes we, we tend to say in some of the coverage out there is, you know, dark pattern, patterns are bad um, or, you know, all dark patterns are illegal or um, immoral or, or whatever. And that's just not the case. Um, I, and we're going to talk about that. The, the, the key thing, we'll get to this here in just a second, is where is the line drawn? Um, and is it drawn in a fair place for you know, both consumers and um, businesses? Um, I did want to talk for a moment about why dark patterns matter. Um, and you know, sometimes we gloss over this, um, but it, it's important. This is a study. So my, my wife is a professor. She's, uh, you know, she deals with like hard information data and she's always sort of pushing me to say, you know, well, it's one thing to sort of say something, but do you have data to back it up? And so here's the data to back up why dark patterns matter. And this is a article from a 2021 article from the Journal of Legal Analysis. It was um, discussed in the FTC report um, that came out in 2022. Um, and essentially what it found, and so this, in the study itself, they did basically a survey of a lot of different folks, and they found that users exposed to mild dark patterns were more than twice as likely to sign up for a dubious service as those assigned to the control group, and uh, it was four times as likely to subscribe if it was aggressive dark patterns. They also noted that aggressive dark patterns can sometimes backfire uh, or create a backlash, but mild dark patterns did not. And I think that's because, you know, going back to the point I made earlier, it's sort of expected, right? We're, we're used to this. Um, it, we're used to sort of tactics by businesses to um, market their products. And, and it's not unsurprisingly, uh, unsurprising. So, um, Another one, less educated subjects were significantly more susceptible to mild dark patterns than their well-educated counterparts. This is what was found in this particular article. And then um, the, there was a second study that went through and identified the dark patterns that seem most likely to be effective with consumers. Um, and it found that the three most effective were hidden information trick question and obstruction strategies or the Roach Motel as um, Frank mentioned. And, and the hidden information one was by far the 
the, the one that was the most powerful and the most likely to um, nudge folks, and, and which makes sense, right? Because if a consumer doesn't know it's there, then um, then it's it's hard to evaluate it and decide whether or not that's something you want. So um, that's what that is about. And I think what we want to try to do now is we're going to go through, well, before we do that, one other thing I want to say real quick, um, and, and that's this line drawing. Um, and this is what's really important because if, if dark patterns are everywhere and some are good, some are acceptable and some are not, it becomes really important where that line is being drawn. And that's sort of what we're dealing with right now. We're going to talk about the FTC enforcement actions out there. FTC has been incredibly aggressive. And uh, we're also going to talk about the FTC v. Amazon uh, suit, which is super um, important in this space. And, and one of the, the big fights that's going on um, is Amazon has filed a motion to dismiss in that particular class action. And one of the arguments they made is, look, the, there's no rule on this. Um, in fact, there's proposed rules out there, such as the proposed negative option rule that um, Frank is going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so basically what the FTC do is doing is they're retroactively trying to apply this proposed rule. Um, and that's not fair to us, Amazon. So this line drawing is really the most important question here. Um, it, because as you're going to see, there are some things that sort of cross the line that we can probably all agree on. There's some things that don't, and then there's sort of a gray area, and, and we're going to go through that. So uh, at this point, um, we're going to go through what some of these dark patterns are and explain it in detail. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we've already talked about this. These are some of the general types of dark patterns inducing false beliefs, hiding information, leading to unauthorized charges or obscuring or subverting privacy choices. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to go through um, all of the different types of dark patterns that were identified in the FTC report that came out um, a couple of years ago. And that FTC report was, it's called Bringing Dark Patterns to Light. It came out in September, 2022 and has been hugely influential in terms of um, almost sort of kickstarting this latest, what you might call feeding frenzy by not just the FTC, but state regulatory um, bodies and state AGs, as well as class actions. Um, and in that they went through, it's, it's, it's really a quite interesting report and then included in their appendix was a compilation of the various kinds of digital dark patterns. We're going to go through those. So let me start with the first one here, which is endorsements. And there's four main kinds. They mentioned the false activity messages, such as, you know, there's 24 other people who are viewing this listing. Now, that's a very common feature in a lot of websites. You know, there's 50 other people viewing this. Um, or, you know, I like to get on Zillow and, um, you know, look at, other properties that I'm never going to buy or couldn't afford. Um, but it'll tell you, you know, here's other people who are looking at this or who've saved it. And it's important to note that it doesn't say that activity messages are a problem. As long as it's true, it's mostly fine. It's if it's false, if it's made up. And, you know, it's saying that 24 people or other people are viewing this particular listing when um, that's not true. It's just randomly generating a number. So that's the problem there. Deceptive consumer testimonials, um, you know, that's where you're not indicating that the endorser was compensated. Um, like I was listening to a, a, a there was a Chick-fil-A one the other day, I think on the radio, and it was, you know, had real consumers coming in uh, talking about their experience and what sandwich they like and that kind of thing. And um, at the end of it, it does a nice job of saying, you know, this is a real customer, but they're being compensated uh, for this testimony. Um, and, and that's, you know, a best practice, right? Uh, there's deceptive celebrity endorsements. Um, and, and that's a, a sort of tricky one that I'm going to talk about here in a moment. 
and then parasocial relationship pressure, using character that children know and trust to try to pressure them to making a certain choice. Um, I guess you could arguably say that Joe Camel are using cartoon characters to try to sell things to kids. Um, here's an example of a deceptive celebrity endorsement. You know, um, it's where they are not actually paying Beyonce or JLo, and, and they even don't even know that, you know, anything about this, um, but they use the picture, the image of these celebrities in the hopes that they can sell it to you. So, um, you know, here are a couple of examples here where they're trying to, they're trying to link their particular product to Beyonce in the hopes that it will induce you to buy it. Um, here's a couple of other ones um, that have had recent activity. The one on the left is um, some FTC warnings to two trade associations and a dozen influencers about social media posts, um, basically indicating that the influencers failed to adequately disclose that they were paid by the industry. And then on the right, also from November of last year, a national advertising division, or NAD, recommended that Kerry Uma disclose uh, its connection um, to the publisher of social media posts. Um, so this is a very active area. There's a lot going on here. Um, and so we want you to be aware if you have social influencers or um, you know consumers or really any kind of testimonials at all, um, you, you need to have ideally a lawyer look at that and make sure that you're doing everything you should to mitigate the risk there. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Frank now to go through another one. All right, so the next uh, type of dark pattern that we'll talk about is scarcity and the two of the big uh, sort of subsets of that are the false low stop message, only one left in stock, order soon. Again, uh, I go back to the example of my kids uh, who really want uh, they really want this toy for their birthday, for Christmas, for whatever, um, and I'm trying to find it, and I found it, but there's only one left. Now, again, as Trent mentioned, and sort of a theme throughout all of these is if they're true, um, then it's likely fine. If you if the store really only has one left, it's probably okay. Um, but at the same time, um, if it, if you're a, if it's a retailer with multiple uh, multiple um, locations, and I'm sitting there on a website um, that has linked as like my quote home store as the one down the street from me, um, and it's saying only one left in stock, order soon. Um, if it's available at the retailer, uh, other, the other retailer's location, you know, two miles away, like, is it really only one left in stock or is it just the one there? Um, the second is the false high demand. Uh, 20 other shoppers have this item in their cart. Um, and, and that's similar to uh, what we have on the right here uh, with the viewed by 20 people for the best value fitness trainer. Um, you know, I'm sitting on my couch eating uh, nachos, uh, thinking about how I need uh, six pack abs, giant uh, biceps and strong legs. And I'm like, oh, well, 20 people have viewed this. It's 20 people have bought it. It's the best value. Well, you know, it must work. Um, so again, it's trying to draw people to, um, to something that might ne necessarily be uh, right there. Um, then we have uh, the flight example. We have a couple of these uh, scarcity, uh, scarcity dark pattern allegations that you could uh, point out here. Only two left in stock at, at $226, only two left at $365. Um, you know, book now before it runs out. You've got the timer trying to um, trying trying to create this sense of urgency. Plus, you have 30 other, three other people looking at this flight. Well, if there are only two left and I've got 18 minutes and there are 33 people trying to buy it, I better go ahead and buy it or else I'm not getting that flight. 
uh, and I'm not, it's not going to be comfortable and it's going to be way more expensive. Um, so again, uh, a lot of it goes back to the wording and, and the truth of what's being uh, portrayed. Um, so, again, uh, we've, as we mentioned at the beginning, these sort of run together, and, and with a lot of these dark patterns, they overlap and they can be used in conjunction with one another. It's not necessarily that you go to a website and you only have the timer, uh, or you only have um, the discount listed. It's um, a lot of it's used, it can be used in conjunction and, and sort of the more that's there, uh, the more that, uh, that regulatory authorities or consumers um, uh, or litigants might, the cumulative effect might uh, be a lot more than if it's just a single one. Uh, so again, the, the baseless countdown timer creates the sense of urgency as you see up in the top uh, along, again, the full body program that I'm um, contemplating buying while I'm dripping nachos all over my sweatpants on my couch. Um, it ends at 15 minutes. Again, I better get it or else it's gonna be more expensive uh, for me to get in shape. The false limited time message deal in soon, kind of the same as the timer. Um, and then also the fake sale, um, price uh, or false reference pricing is just a, um, a claim that there's a discount uh, when there might not really be one. And so uh, going to the, uh, on, the false, on the false reference price, um, we've seen a number of class actions filed in these uh, related to these allegations. And if you look at the clip um, from the Shutterfly litigation that we list here, uh, it says subtotal 149.98 with a strike through, and then in red, jumping out at you, is this 74.99. Uh, Again, is that 149 price real or is it not? But what it's trying to do is uh, it's trying to create a sense of urgency that you're getting a deal when uh, you're not. Uh, and we'll just note here that State by state, there are sometimes um, very specific rules about when you can use this. Um, for example, like if this was sold for 149.98 within 30 days, then it's fine to say that that's the reference price. But if it was a year ago or two years ago, it, it might not fly. And I'll turn to Trent. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, so one thing going back real quick to the uh, phantom discount pricing, it's also called false reference pricing. Uh, it's it's very, very, very prevalent. Um, it's, a, it's, it's something a very common practice. Uh, we've counseled a number of clients on this type of thing. Um, it's something to be very careful about uh, because especially if it's online, it's very easy for enterprising plaintiff's attorneys to check on the price. And if if you if it's always on sale, then uh, the, that increases the chances that you're going to get sued for this kind of thing. So um, that's definitely, I guess, a red flag. A uh, particular one that you're going to want to focus on is this one right here. Um, okay, uh, real quickly, I want to hit uh, another one, which is types of dark patterns obstruction. Um, basically, it makes it hard to cancel. Is really the big one, or delete an account. Um, and you know, I know like at Facebook, you have to go through some really rigorous process in order to actually delete your account. Um, and the same thing with cancellation. And I, and I want to give you an example here. So this is a case from, I believe, 2021, uh, Age of Learning, um, and a product called ABC Mouse. And essentially, um, FTC went after them because they required consumers to navigate between six and nine screens to cancel their membership. They, you couldn't skip ahead, you couldn't cancel without visiting each screen, and there were multiple save offers or, or other reminders about all the value you were currently getting that you would give up uh, in there. So, uh, you know, here's a tactic where, you know, they're bombarding you with, did you know you can access the full curriculum? Um, and here's another one. Before you go, um, we're going to try to keep your business uh, by, by, you know, making you uh, 
giving you a savings offer of 68%. And this is very common, and this in and of itself is, I don't think, necessarily um, an issue. Um, but when you combine it with a long click-through process um, where, you know, it may take a number of clicks to actually, um, you know, do it, then that can become actionable. And, and if you look down here at the very bottom, you see three options, back home, no thanks, I'll wait, or continue, uh, which can be confusing. Like, which one, if I actually am trying to cancel this, uh, which one do I hit? Um, is there a difference between no thanks, I'll wait, and continue? Um, I'll wait on what? Wait on the offer or wait on canceling? Unclear. So um, this particular website resulted in a $9.7 million settlement with the FTC for this click-through process, this obstruction tactic. So that's a concrete example of something that I think we should all keep, be aware of. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Frank to handle sneaking or hiding information. So sneaking or hiding information, um, a lot of the hidden information relates to uh, hidden costs or fees. Uh, the example that we gave earlier of getting to check out and you've got 17 different fees that have been tacked on to the end. Um, and then you have the auto enrollment, uh, the ABC mouse type uh, information where you might not necessarily realize you're auto enrolling um, or the as you go through the transaction, um, it auto enrolls you before you get to the end. Um, and then uh, the other one I want to highlight is sneak in a basket. We've seen some litigation over that when you're buying, um, when a consumer is buying a product and the website purportedly, set, purportedly says you need this object uh, to go with it to make it work and um, it automatically buys it um, and puts it in the basket. And again, once you're at the end, is that really necessary? Um, this is just an example of an auto enrollment um, from Octavia litigation uh, where you are uh, signing up for this weight loss program. Uh, you get a, you join Octavia Premier for free and then you see in the bottom right, it's automatically checked that you'd like to join it. Uh, and then in smaller print says you, uh, you'll be charged fees on a recurring basis um, and all that fun stuff. But again, it, it the problem here was allegedly that the website made the selection for you. You did not, uh, the consumer did not click that box. It just popped up with it clicked and the consumer had to, uh, had to do that. We've also, um, you know, this is just an example, uh, free titles trying to uh, Amazon and it's audible app uh, getting people free alleging free books and then uh, trapping them into a monthly subscription free monthly subscription fee when it runs out. Um, and this uh, this heck case, uh, there was a motion to dismiss filed and actually last month, uh, it was granted in part and denied in part and it's gone through. Uh, we've seen a couple of uh, different litigations related to the audible subscription um, and in federal court in Washington state uh, last fall, Audible actually got it dismissed, uh, and the court said, you disclosed that this auto-enrollment would happen, and they, they agreed to the terms, so uh, it's not plausible that they didn't know about it. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Trent. All right, uh, food delivery and, and these type of delivery services um, are a big one as well. Um, you know, it's something I don't do a great deal, but I, I did do it recently and I did notice that, you know, if you buy a burger on, say, a, a particular restaurant's website, it may be, you know, eight bucks. But if you actually buy it through Grubhub uh, or, or DoorDash or Uber Eats or one of those, then it may be, you know, 12 bucks. Um, and, and sometimes it may not be entirely clear that that is the case. Um, so you know, because of that, there have been a number of actions, uh, both class actions, as well as, um, you know, uh, various municipalities and states that have gone after some of these food delivery things and, and, and um, you know, hidden surcharges, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's one thing to be aware of. Online ticket purchases, this is a big one. 
Um, and, you know, there have been a ton of various both regulatory actions and class actions that are going after ticket purchases because, you know, all of these things that we've been talking about, you see when you buy tickets. Um, you know, you have a certain amount of time. There, there, you know, there's only so many tickets. Um, we're going to, you know, add on, um, you know, your typical convenience fees or these other fees at the end rather than at the beginning. Um, so it has been a very, very active area. Um, and in particular, um, we have seen a ton of these in just the last few weeks um, because the New York Arts and Cultural Affairs Law, which requires ticket sellers to disclose the total cost of the ticket, inclusive of, of all ancillary fees uh, in a clear and conspicuous manner um, and, you know, to, to not wait to the last minute to do it. And so there have been a number of class actions filed, and I'm going to show you here in a few minutes, uh, literally just in the past couple of weeks uh, on this alone. So New York is, is being bombarded with these type of class actions right now based on this law. And there are other laws that are similar to this. There's a California Ticket Seller Act that is somewhat similar to this, and, and we may see um, other states uh, enact similar laws. So this is something that you're going to want to keep an eye on because um, it, it may end up, um, you know, really leading to a lot of new litigation and regulatory enforcement. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Frank to deal with interface interference quickly. So interface uh, interference is really uh, just using the user, having the user experience uh, sort of disguise what's really going on uh, by pushing them in a different direction, um, disguising ads, um, uh, bait and switch type, uh, type actions. And, and one of the examples of those that we have here is the uh, Windows 10 has recommended uh, this pop-up. It's Windows 10's recommended recommended update for this PC. Now, if you look at the top right where we've highlighted in the uh, in the red box, there's an X to click out of it because it's a pop-up ad. But the ad itself um, says "Upgrade now" and "OK," and they're both they're both things that if you click on it, it's just going to take you uh, to this upgrade um, where uh, that isn't necessarily needed and it's been disguised as an app. Yeah, so the point there being, if you, even if you click on the X, it still, um, you know, has you um, doing this particular upgrade, which is sort of counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, the burying options, uh, this goes back to uh, just another example uh, of the trip insurance. Uh, Airbnb got hit with a lawsuit in Northern District of California. And really, you have the zero trip insurance option. You have the $335 uh, euro trip uh, insurance that you can select and pay for. But then in fine print down at the bottom, it says you can actually get a full cash refund from us. Uh, by calling if you uh, have exigent cir extreme circumstances, uh, you know, a hurricane comes, uh, you call up Airbnb and you say, hey, a hurricane came, uh, and then they'd uh, potentially give it back to you. Uh, my other example of, uh, of the flying we have here, you uh, you know, at the very top, it's suggesting I should enhance my experience and make it as comfortable as possible and automatically selects first class for my flight uh, from Phoenix to Seattle um, for a, an extra $169. Um, and it highlights in red, jumping out at me, pay for this selection now, whereas the more muted gray uh, says no thanks and I'll continue checking in. Again, it's the contrast of the colors the suggestive language uh, that really is uh, what the user is going to be potentially confused by. With that, I'll turn it back over to Trent. So uh, this one is really the same thing, right? I mean, you see, enter your email address, and it doesn't have to be always like, you know, buying something. It could be trying to get personal information from you. And, um, you know, it's a very prominent button, radio button here, enter your email address in blue, has a contrast. And the no, I like ignoring potential risk in e-commerce is very small. 
uh, very small font, not in color. And it's, that's actually a form of confirm shaming, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. Um, I'm going to move on now to types of uh, the other type of dark pattern is coerced action. It's unauthorized transactions, um, kids gaming apps, which is a big one. Uh, we're going to talk about the Epic Games settlement, which is really the biggest one to date um, from an FTC action. Um, there's autoplay, there's nagging, acting repeatedly and disruptively if a user wants to take an action. Are you sure? As uh, Frank mentioned earlier, uh, forced registration, you have to create an account to continue with your purchase. Uh, and then, you know, things like asking for an email address or social media permissions for one purpose, but then using it for another. It's, it's fine to ask for an email address as long as it's clear what it's being used for. But if you if you use a trick, to get the email address and then use it for something else, that's where it's a problem. Um, so we're now gonna move to asymmetrical choice, which is a big one. Um, and Frank's gonna talk about that quickly as well. So that asymmetric choice uh, dark pattern really goes back to what we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of previously where the choice is already made for the consumer. Uh, the box is already checked, it's pre-selected, um, or it uses confusing language to, uh, to get the consumer's attention or to get them to, to check the box when they really shouldn't. Uh, kind of an extreme example of this is opt-in, don't opt-out, don't not opt-in. And then in the very, uh, in very gray font at the bottom, opt out of all. Like what is opt in, don't opt out, and don't not opt in. I mean, it all is very confusing and trying to select for the consumer uh, to opt in. Okay, so here's confirm shaming. Uh, and I, I love these because they're, they're sort of funny to be honest. They're basically saying you either do what, um, you know, take the $5 off now. And if you don't, you're a big old dummy. Um, you know, I prefer to pay full price. This is everywhere. Um, and, and so, you know, um, I see it, you know, multiple times a day. So there's a lot of this out there and, and it's something to, if, if you're, you know, in, in the business and you're doing this kind of thing, you need to be aware that that's what this is. That's confirmed shame. Um, now we're going to move quickly through a few and maybe skip a few things because we're running out of time and there's some things that I want to get to. Um, and, you know, you should have access to these slides. If you don't let us know. Um, the, so we have gone through everything uh, that the various types of examples of dark patterns. And I think that's really important to do so that we know what we're talking about. Let's talk about some recent FTC settlements. Uh, and let me maybe start by just saying this, the FTC, um, they're not playing around. And this is frankly the most active, the most aggressive that I have ever seen the FTC. You know, lots of times, um, and, and it's sort of by the book to say, oh, you know, agencies like the FTC or FDA, they don't have a lot of resources. So they sort of pick and choose carefully who they go after and they don't do a whole lot of it. Well, um, they still may be picking and choosing carefully who to go after, but they are being very aggressive and they have been very successful in going after dark patterns. You have the Epic Games, which is Fortnite, 245 millions um, there uh, to deter users from requesting refunds for certain in-game changes, 18 million for Publishers Clearinghouse and a number of other ones. Um, and so I'll say this, if you don't hear anything else today, just hear this. Recognize the FTC is very aggressive in this. And if you are engaging in flagrant dark patterns, um, fix it now because um, there's a very good chance that either the FTC or you know a state or municipality or a class action is, is gonna come after it because this is really front of mind right now. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about this FTC v. Amazon case as well, because it's a big one. Basically, FTC, um, after their report and after some of the other success that they have had against, you know, entities like Epic Games, um, the, you know, what's the old adage that if you want to be the, the tough guy or tough gal on the block, then you find the biggest, bad, baddest bully 
or the biggest person on the block and immediately pick a fight with them. And that's exactly what the FTC did here by going after Amazon. Um, so the complaint alleged that Amazon used manipulative and coercive and deceptive user interface designs um, to trick consumers into enrolling and automatically renewing Prime subscriptions. Now they changed it right before this complaint was filed. Um, but you know, I, I've talked to people and, and, and I was talking to a client last week and they told me that they were tricked into doing it. They didn't realize they had automatically enrolled for Prime until they saw it on their credit card a month later. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I think was a real concern for some. Um, and what's significant about this complaint in, in a number of ways is one, they went after employees in their amended complaint, they filed suit, uh, against three Amazon executives as defendants. And they quoted from some internal Amazon emails where the employees questioned what Amazon was doing. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the quote is this, we congratulate when someone changes a headline color or the style of a table, but don't notice we are not even telling customers what they are signing up for, end quote. So that's an internal email from Amazon that was included in the complaint. Um, and basically what this, let me go to the next slide. Um, here are some of the quotes from it. Um, there was a process called the Iliad Flow where it was designed, the allegation is Amazon designed this to make it as difficult as possible to um, actually uh, cancel the Amazon Prime subscription. And this has turned into a big, nasty fight between FTC and Amazon. As I uh, mentioned earlier, the FTC um, is trying to get it dismissed. And here is the, 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 the money quote from their motion to dismiss, which says, quote, the FTC has admitted it must promulgate new rules to define the negative option marketing covered by ROSCA because the current laws are problematically unclear, even for businesses trying to comply with the law. At bottom, the FTC seeks to retroactively impose its interpretation of as yet promulgated rules on Amazon in clear violation of Amazon's due process rights. So this is going to be a really important one to watch. It's going to um, it's going to tell the tale about um, you know what's going to end up happening in, in future FTC enforcement action. So we're going to watch it, and uh, we'll report back as to what ends up happening there. Um, I wanted to mention briefly class actions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Frank for just a minute uh, to talk about negative options uh, very briefly. Um, there have been a number of class actions filed. These are class actions that have been filed literally within the last you know, 10 days. Um, these are all the New York Arts and Cultural Affairs law that I mentioned about processing and convenience fees uh, for tickets. And you see um, you know, some smaller entities, but some bigger ones like AMC, SeatGeek, StubHub. Um, and then we have a number of other class actions also filed within the last, um, you know, most of these are filed Two of them filed in the last 10 days and the two were filed in January. Um, and, you know, that one, I guess, Amazon about the big box algorithm is uh, going to be one to watch. But then you have like the false reference pricing for Brooklyn betting um, and then, you know, some other ticket issues. So there's a lot out there. Um, there haven't been a whole lot of class action settlements um, in part because, you know, when you're dealing online, you're dealing with arbitration provisions, you're dealing with class action waivers which come into play, but there has been a big one against Noom, uh, class action settlement of approximately 60 million within the last couple of years. Um, and with that, I'm going to skip ahead to the negative option rule. And um, Frank, if you can maybe mention it in about one minute and then we'll go to, uh, you know, some things. Waste, 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 waste. Sorry. Uh, so the negative option rule, um, is a rule that the FTC has had in place for a number of years, um, and it currently only applies to the pre-notification plans, uh, to the CDs and the records that Trent was buying back in his youth. Um, you know, the FTC uh, in 2009 actually reported uh, a report indicated that consumers generally enjoy these types of plans, 
Um, but what the FTC has proposed doing was to update the negative option rule to include uh, a number of things to uh, combat these supposed dark patterns. Uh, the big one that I'll highlight is the click to cancel rule uh, that would require businesses to make it, uh, quote, as easy as, uh, end quote, enrolling. So if you have uh, one quote, if you have one click to enroll in an auto enrollment scheme, uh, you should have one click to unenroll. Uh, it requires a number of new disclosures. It requires annual reminders, um, and it requires separate uh, consent um, to specifically accept the negative option enrollment uh, that's separate uh, from the goods and services. Why don't we go ahead and go to the yeah. tips? So um, we'll go to the strategies to mitigate, and I'll uh, hand it back over to Trent. OK, so here, you know, these are some best practices, I guess. Um, it's important to remember there's no bright line rule in this, um, and not even all the alleged dark pattern practices have been litigated or even found yet. So the most important thing is to go through your processes online and make sure that you're not doing anything that raises red flags. Uh, easier said than done. Um, consider how the consumer experiences it, right? Um, and you can do some A-B testing, um, which will help um, using lots of notices and disclaimers. One of the things that I really like, in addition to notices and disclaimers, is having a little I button for information so that um, you know it's, it's really easy to find out uh, certain things. Even better than that is if there's a way to actually include you know, required information or really important information where you don't even have to click on the button, then that's even better. Um, so you know, those are a couple things. Um, I always think it's helpful to look at what peers are doing because if you're an outlier, then you are more likely to um, have the FTC or a class action lawyer go after you. But, and this is a really important point, don't blindly trust it because there are, you know, FTC is not afraid to go after an entire industry, nor are class action lawyers. So just because like, oh my gee, you know, geez, my three other competitors are doing the same thing. Don't let that necessarily um, get, you know, make it to where you sleep better at night. You, you actually have to do the work, work, I think, to ensure that it adds, actually is okay. That means keeping up the date on regulatory trends. What's the FTC doing? What is NAD doing? Keeping up the date on state laws, which is really hard because there's a lot of them out there and a lot of changes. Uh, I think another one, which is a really good idea is look at the consumer complaints. If you have a lot of complaints from consumers saying, geez, I tried to cancel and I couldn't, um, then you know that should, there should be some type of action uh, on that. Um, avoiding urgency claims if possible, um, but it, if you do have urgency claims, then be prepared to back it up. There actually are 25 people. We have something that allows us to know there are 25 people, 24 people who are viewing this particular product right now. Uh, if you're charging a fee, make sure that it's bona fide, including the explanation of what it is, uh, and be transparent. Um, it is best to use all-in pricing when possible um, so that the consumer knows as quickly as possible how much they're going to have to pay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, evaluate buy flows. Can they may be made clear or more user-friendly? Um, make sure that consumers are not scrolling for key information. Options parity is important. So you don't want to have a radio button um, for the very prominent, you know, upgrade now and then something very small. Uh, no, I don't want to. Try to keep them having some parity. Uh, I mentioned earlier the A-B testing, if possible. Um, involve lawyers from start to finish in evaluating the design, if possible, as well. Um, and then, you know, um, we've already talked about a couple of these, but also consider the interface because it matters whether or not, and, and I think we all know this, whether you're using your phone or a computer. Um, so with that, uh, let me see if Frank has anything he wants to add. Um, 
and then we'll wrap up here after that. Thanks, Trent. Um, the one, uh, the consent is key, uh, always being able to show the consumer is given their knowing and informed consent. One of the uh, key themes throughout motions to dismiss and a lot of the litigation that we've highlighted and are contained in the slides are motions to compel arbitration and clash action waivers. Uh, there's usually always a mixed bag uh, with courts enforcing them or not, um, but um, that's just in terms of a litigation trend that uh, it's something that we see um, a lot. So, um, but other than that, nothing else. And there was one question that we had that I just wanted to real quickly address and then we'll wrap up. And basically the question is this, um, in this world of dark patterns, for an individual plaintiff rather than a class action, how likely is a defendant to try to settle with an individual plaintiff? And that's a great question, and it's one that's you know it's hard. It depends on what they're doing. I think you have to do an evaluation. But the one thing that I think does matter and that has to be taken into consideration is do you want a lawsuit out there, um, especially in federal court, where everyone can see it? So if you have a problem, if you have something that with an evaluation, um, you think you may have a problem. If there's a lawsuit filed, then all of a sudden other folks see it, the FTC may take notice and they may come after you. So um, that might factor into whether you decide to settle with that individual plaintiff. Um, okay, so that is it for today. Thank you so much. We really appreciated y'all being here uh, and joining us. If you have any questions after this, feel free to email or call us. Uh, my understanding is these slides will be available for download from our website in a couple of days. If you would like a copy prior to that, feel free to email me or Frank, and we'll be happy to get it to you. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it.